mute. That's not mute. Um, is everybody? Huh. Okay. Must be on mute. No, the, this is on. That's plugged in. The This seems to be on here. I don't see anything here that's not working. Um, let me just double check. Okay, that's the camera. I, I see your messages, guys. I see your messages. Oh, so you're back on now? Yes, now you can hear. Oh, okay. I have no idea what that was. That may must have been just some temporary thing because um, I didn't change anything um, from where it was. I had set everything up ahead of time and didn't change it. Anyway, well, if you missed any of that, it was all completely <laughs> just jibber-jabber. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, okay, I, I got it, guys. Thank you. I'm glad we have sound, and you don't have to tell me anymore. Um, but anyway, so sorry about that. I just mentioned the fact that I had almost, I, di I didn't really say anything super significant. I said that um, I had almost canceled tonight ahead of time because we are, um, we were going out to a dinner with some friends, which is like the first non-family people we've hung out with since the pandemic. Some very, very dear, close, longtime friends of ours our friends Teresa and Patty and Doug and Barb, um, all of whom was grand to see and spend time with. And uh, But because we were driving over the hill and I didn't know how late we'd be staying, I was kind of going, uh, but anyway, as it turned out, it all worked fine. Um, and I am here. And now my sound is on too, so it's all good. Other than that, um, I was just reporting that I have sent into the narrow darks proofs, or I've finished into the narrow darks typeset proofs, which is the last stage of main, you know, the main proofing thing for me. Um, I still have a few more little bits and bobs that I have to do before it goes um, goes to you know final publication. Um, you know, I have to do the acknowledgments and that kind of stuff. But I've done a lot of that already. So basically, I am now finished with Into the Narrow Dark in most ways. And I can go straight back again to Navigator's Children because I don't, I, I, I don't go do other projects if I can avoid them while I'm working on something. In this case, I had to work on Into the Narrow Dark, but that's part of the same project anyway. Um, so Into the Narrow Dark, now done. And I was saying, and the other thing I was saying... Um, that uh, a couple of you, and obviously at least two of them I've seen here of our regular group, um, have, have actually read the third volume. So there will not be any surprises for them in it. Um, but uh, I, I, I look forward to hearing what the rest of you think. I'm very pleased with the book. I think it's, uh, even though it's really half a book in some ways, but uh, it's got enough stuff happening and enough dramatic stuff happening at the end that although it obviously ends on several cliffhangers because, you know, it's, it's, it's the middle of a book, you know, it was the middle of a very large book that I had to cut in half. But I think it, it had its, you know, it was where the book was going to end sort of part two of four anyway. So, you know, there, there's some natural closure there. Um, but I think also there's a lot of surprises and things and a lot of the beginnings of the revelations that will explain a lot of the mysteries set up in Witchwood Crown and Empire of Grass. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, it I think July is the pub date, and I am, as I said, I'm pleased with it. I, I don't think I'm senile yet. I, I think I'm still capable of writing a, a fairly decent book. So um, I, I it's always just nice to be finish your proofs and go like, yeah, that's pretty good. I'm 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 not ashamed of that book at all, um, and I'm definitely not ashamed of this one. Um, rather proud. It's also, I think it's also nice just to be feeling like, yeah, I'm still doing the best I can do every time. I I I can't imagine how it would feel to be phoning something in. I mean, I do remember sort of what that's like from jobs that I had back in the old days <laughs> when I was working for other people, especially people I didn't really respect very much. Um, but I don't, certainly never in my career have I ever knowingly given anything less than 100% in my books. Because, you know, I mean, it's got your name on and it goes out into the world. People, you know, that may be the only contact I have with, I mean, obviously I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of my readers over the years and some of them have become very important friends. But 
it's for most people the only contact they will ever have with me and my name is through reading the books themselves and therefore you know the last thing i want is for someone to pick up one of my books and say oh you know he's really you know he clearly is just coasting at this point you know i'm i'm I, I can't imagine doing that, and I can't imagine how I would feel um, doing that, you know? I mean, as long as I am going to be writing books, I will be writing the best damn books that I can write and giving it everything that I have. Um, so I don't know why I'm saying this. Nobody accused me of anything otherwise. <laughs> Nobody went, yeah, you're just phoning it in, Williams. Um, it's just me, and me thinks the lad doth protest too much. So, what else? Anything else? Uh, I think that's all I covered in the first few mo few minutes while the sound was off. So now, I am going to go quickly uh, down and say hello to people who have checked in here. So first off, of course, is Mr. Unangst, to whom I say, Mr. Unangst. And who else is here? Jennifer, hope you're having the best day you can. I am. I'm having the best darn day I can. And it's actually been a really good day. As I mentioned, it's, I finished the proofs. Um, I did a bunch of other stuff that I had to do. And, you know, like just the kind of normal household stuff and business stuff and things like that. And then we went over the hill and had dinner with some dear friends um, who we haven't seen for a while. And it was all really, that was all good. And I got back in time to be able to do the reading tonight without a problem, which is all really good too. And um, yeah, so no complaints. Good day. Um, yeah, and tomorrow's my birthday. Hooray! Um, not that I'm going to be doing anything very exciting. We may not even do our normal out to dinner thing since we just went to dinner tonight. Um, I may put it off till the weekend or something. But anyway, so that's that's where I'm at. So yes, Jennifer, thank you. I am having a darn nice day so far. Ronnie, hello, good morning. Yeah, back to that confusing period between the U.S. time change and the European time change. I know, I know. I mean, you'd think they'd at least all get together and say, well, those of you who are going to do daylight savings, let's all do them on the same day so we don't mess up international business. But I guess that's too much to ask. Anamika, good morning. Good to see you. Mark, hello, hello from Yorkshire and thank you for the comments on the shirt. I was thinking, you know, I actually wore this out with like a suit coat, like a black suit coat over it tonight, which looked very nice, I thought. And I was thinking like, maybe I should spare them from the full lemony goodness of this shirt. You know, you, you folks, I thought, you know, maybe I should keep the jacket on just to tone down the citrus a wee bit. And then I thought, nah, they're, they're grown-ups. They can handle it. They, you know, they can stand up to this much lemony excitement. So anyway, thank you for the compliment. It's, uh, Deb gave me this shirt. And uh, it's, uh, Deb is constantly, bless her, she's constantly trying to get me out of all black. Which, you know, I don't know whether it was because, you know, I, when I was a teenager, I read that black was slimming or because I was, you know, going through difficult phases in my life and just started wearing black, or I'll tell you something true, which is very rare. I will tell you something true. One of them is that I got into the habit of having like black slacks and black suit coat and like black overcoat and black shoes of some kind, another, when I went on tour. Because the thing is, is then you can just take a few shirts and stuff and everything goes together. You never have to go, oh my God, I've only got the purple shirt left, but I've got the, the, the green tweed suit and they just don't go to, you know. It's like if you're wearing all black except for your shirt or a tie if you want to wear one or whatever, not only can you put together basically anything, but you, you can also just wear a t-shirt under it and it looks like, like you're at least trying. You know, and I figure when I'm out on tour doing a reading tour or something like that, I want people to think I'm at least trying, you know, that I'm giving it my best. So anyway, so that and so black is really good for touring. And so for a combination of all those reasons, probably I just started wearing all black and I still do mostly. I'm, you know, most days if you see me, I'm going to be wearing black jeans, black T-shirt. It's not because I'm goth or emo, or, or I think I'm a rock star, or anything like that. It's just, I just got into the habit. Most of my, many of my clothes are black. People started giving me black t-shirts of various kinds with interesting sayings on them. Anyway, so 
Uh, nobody asked me that, but I told you about it anyway. And that's the kind of extra value you get from a tad thing of any kind. Extra value, little little gift, free sample, you know. Anyway, so thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Holger, hello, hello. And oh, good. It's, it is in Valdesru, where Holger is. It is sunny, and I'm glad to hear it. No, dinner, is, dinner was not heavy. I didn't actually eat all that much. And I am very much enjoying the uh, getting to share with listeners. And yes, if life gives you lemons, get tequila and have a party. Amen, bro. Amen. Okay, now we get into all the people saying we have no sound. Okay, and we've now solved that apparently. Mahmoud, hello. Good to see you, bud. Kristen, hello. Pleasure. Jeremy, even though you were just trying to tell me about the sound... Um, good to see you anyway. You were one of the people I referred to earlier who actually has read volume three. Petra, checking in from Berlin. <clears throat> okay, and here's Ilva. Everybody is telling me that I have no sound. I wasn't muted because I've got, it's got a little green button on the uh, microphone and it, it's been on the whole time. I have no idea what that was about. Um, anyway, what else? Jessica, hello, Jessica. Good to see you. And Holger, I think I already said hello to you, but yes, I just did, just a moment ago, of course. Uh, it's hard to sort out the ones that are about the sound not working from the other ones. So um, who else have we got here? Ronnie. <laughs> Ronnie says, I'm sure all this is all fascinating. I gave you all the best bits. Wouter, Wouter, good to see you. Um, and hello, Ilva. There you are not telling me about the sound. Um, Thank you for the work, much appreciated, and um, I gather that you are hearing what I had to say to Ilva, along with Jeremy and Ron, who is quite often on the Sunday night broadcast, the Sunday evening broadcast, um, are three of the four people who've been really helping me quite a bit with the books over the, the years since I started back into Austin Art. I mean, I've known them since before that, they've been readers and friends since well before this last uh, set of projects. But I, I realized very early on that um, Ilvin Ron, who were the first two, Ilvin Ron both knew the Ostenard books better than I did because, of course, I literally had not read them except for little segments that I had read before I wrote The Burning Man. But I had not read the book as a whole, the, you know, the first set of books, The Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn in 20 something years, you know, and I really had, there was all these things I didn't know. I kept, you know, putting characters in the new books and they would have to tell me that those characters were actually dead and it was embarrassing. So they've kind of become the, the, uh, the, the advanced, the advanced squad, you know, they like look at the manuscripts or sometimes I even contact them ahead of time and say, do you remember where this might be in the manuscript that I, you know, in the original books that I said such and such? And they've been a huge amount of help. So those of you who are enjoying the Ostenard, the new Ostenard books, you, you owe a debt of thanks to uh, Ilva, Ron, Jeremy, and Angela, who is the fourth one. But Angela uh, doesn't tend to come by, pop by these, these uh, readings. So, Kristen, hello. If I didn't say hello to you already, good to see you. Let's see, who else? All right, we got the sound back on, guys. Okay, everybody's telling me about the sound, about the sound, about the... And Other Brother says, oh, dear, dear Tad. Yesterday was fabulous, by the way. Oh, that was the... Um, we did the cover reveal for the Grim Oak pub specialty publication of Dragonbone Chair, and I got to sit down with Sean from Grim Oak, who is a great guy and who I've been friends with for years, and I signed special book orders for and stuff. Um, and then Donato, who is the artist who did the cover and, and the interior illustrations, which are lovely, and that was great fun. So, and we, we were on for a long time, like two hours, so we really covered a lot of stuff. Okay, so... Sounds back on. Who did I not say hello to yet before so I can get to reading because it's getting late? Uh, Wouter, Mark, I said, Jennifer, Jerry, Jessica again, Holger, Ilva. I think there's only like five of you guys listening here. That's okay, though. Um, I don't count numbers. Chris, there's Chris, just as it starts. Okay, but Chris is here, so good. 
Glad to see you, Chris. Um, I hope the weather's nice in where you are. And uh, Iris, hello. Yes, Iris has complimented me on my citrus-themed shirt. Andre, good to see you. And okay, I think that's it. So we are going to read now. I am going to read now. Where we were, I just got seven up on my nose. Where we were last time um, was we were with Paul Jonas. Paul Jonas and Galley, one of the Oyster House gang, had escaped from the Eight Squared, which is, for those who didn't recognize it, well, I'm sure you all recognized it, if you haven't read the book already, which you probably also have, many of you. Um, eight Squared, obviously, was Alice's looking glass world. Not, not the Wonderland world from the first book, although it's similar. Um, but it's same Alice, but in the second book, she goes through the looking glass chasing her kitten. Damn, those cats, man. That's all they do is cause trouble. Anyway, so Paul and Galley escaped from the world, which is weird, first of all, because Galley came with him, which was kind of strange. Then they found themselves on a world which they are only now beginning to realize is actually Mars. Um, and not just Mars, but a weird Mars sort of colonized by, among other things, Englishmen right out of a uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs novel or something even slightly earlier. Um, so that's what we're going. So Paul has just met. Um, oh, so Paul saw uh, somebody he recognized. We recognize her as the bird woman from his dream, the castle dream with the giant back at the beginning. Um, but he recognized her. He found out afterwards from Kluru, who is a Nimbor, which is one of the kind of more serf-like or peasant-like groups on Mars, um, that uh, from Kluru he learned that she is actually from Venus, Vonar, and that she is a uh, going to be a ritual at sacrifice, I think he's found that out already. If not, I've just given you a spoiler, but that's okay. Um, and then as they're going, they've gone all the way up the, the great mountain at the heart of this particular Mars. And at the top, they've found um, not only all kinds of interesting Martians and Venusians and things like that, but that they've just met some English people, um, which was very, very strange, obviously. Um, and I'm going to actually go back just a little bit. Say, dash rude of me to come, just to come belting up to you this way and not introduce myself, the blonde man said. Brummond, Hurley Brummond, used to be Captain Brummond of Her Majesty's lifeguard. But that was long ago and far away, I suppose. Ah, and here's my friend Professor Bagwalter, caught up at last. Say hello, Bags. He gestured to an older man, also bearded but more formally dressed, who was limping toward them a frock coat draped over his arm. The new arrival paused before them, panting, removed spectacles, which had been steamed opaque, then took out his handkerchief and wiped at his steaming, streaming brow. Good Lord, Brumman, you have led me a chase. He waited for a few more breaths before continuing. Pleasure to meet you folks. We saw you go in at the gate. That's right, said the blonde man. We don't see many of our folk here, and we know pretty near all of them. Still, we didn't chase you just because you were new faces, he laughed. It's not that boring at the Ares Club. The professor coughed. I didn't chase them at all. I was trying to keep up with you. And a damn foolish idea, too, in this swelter. Brumman turned back to Paul. Truth is, for a moment I thought you were an old friend of mine. Billy Kirk, his name was. Kedgery Kirk, we used to call him on account of he was so particular about breakfast. He and I fought together in Crimea, at Sevastopol, and Balaclava. Fine gunnery men, one of the best. But I saw as soon as I caught you up that it wasn't so. Damned remarkable likeness, though. Paul was having trouble keeping up with Brumman's swift, clipped speech. No, my name is Paul. Paul... He hesitated for a moment as he felt even his name grow slippery and dubious. Paul Jonas, this is Galley. 
and Kluru here, who pulled us out of the Great Canal. Fine boy, said Brummond, ruffing, ruffling Galley's hair. The boy scowled. Kluru, who had fallen silent at the man's initial approach, seemed just as happy to be ignored. Professor Bagwalter was looking at Paul speculatively, as though he were an interesting example of some rather arcane scientific effect. You uh, have a strange accent, Mr. Jonas. Are you Canadian? Paul stared, caught off balance. I... I don't think I am. Bagwalter raised a bushy eyebrow at Paul's answer, but Brumman reached out and clasped Paul by the shoulder. His grip was very strong. Good Lord, Bags, we aren't going to stand here in the blazing sun while you riddle away with some linguistic nonsense of yours, are we? Pay no attention, Jonas. The professor can't listen to the first bluebird of spring without wanting to dissect it. But, as long as we've interrupted your day, let us buy you a drink, what? There's a fair to middling saw's house, just down that little side street there. We'll get the boy something weaker, eh? He laughed and squeezed Paul's shoulder companionably. For a moment, Paul was afraid something might be pulled loose. No, better still, Brumman said. We'll take you to the Aries Club. Do you good. Give you a taste of home. Come then, what do you say? That's, that's fine, Paul replied. Paul was dismayed to discover that the Aries Club doorman, a rather ill-favored Taltor, would not allow Kluru to enter. No dog faces, he pronounced and would not entertain further discussion. A potentially embarrassing situation was avoided when the Nimbor volunteered to show Galley around the bazaar. Paul accepted the offer gratefully, but Brummond did not seem to approve. Listen, old man, he said as Galley and Kluru walked away. Love thy neighbor, all oh, well and good sort of thing, but you won't get far putting too much faith in greenskins. What do you mean? Well, they can be all right in their way, and this one seems fond of you and the boy, but just don't expect him to cover your back. They're not trustworthy, not like an earthman, if you see what I mean. The inside of the club seemed strangely familiar. A word, Victorian, drifted through Paul's head, but he did not know what it meant. The furniture was heavy and overstuffed, the walls paneled in dark wood. Dozens of strange creatures' heads on plaques, or unplaqued but companioned by the rest of their stuffed bodies, stared down at the visitors. Except for Paul and his two companions, the club seemed empty, which gave the ranked, glassy stairs an even more intimidating effect. Brumman saw Paul staring at a huge shaggy head, vaguely feline, but with the mandibles of an insect. Nasty-looking customer, eh? That's a yellow stone cat. Live in the foothills. Eat anything they can get, including you and me and Auntie Maud. Almost as unpleasant as a blue squanch. What Hurley's not mentioning is that he's the one who dragged in that particular trophy, said Professor Bagwalter dryly. Killed it with a cavalry saber. Brumman shrugged. Got a bit lucky. You know the sort of thing. With a wide choice of tables, they selected one at a small window overlooking what Paul assumed was the bazaar, a massive public square almost completely covered with small awnings. A vast crowd, primarily Martians, swirled in and out beneath them. Paul watched it, amazed by the vitality and activity. He almost thought he could see patterns in the ebb and flow of the marketers, repeating designs, spontaneous shared movements like a flock of birds on the wing. Jonas? Brumman nudged him. What's your poison, old man? Paul looked up. An aged nimbor wearing an incongruous-looking white dinner jacket was waiting patiently for his order. Without knowing where the idea came from, he asked for a brandy. The nimbor inclined his head and disappeared on soundless feet. You know, of course, that the local brandy is barely fit to hold the name, said Professor Bagwalter. Still, it's a damn sight better than the local beer. 
He fixed Paul with his sharp brown eyes. So what brings you to Tuktubim, Mr. Jonas? I asked if you were Canadian because I thought you might have come in with Lubert on large door. They say he's got a lot of Canucks in his crew. Blood and thunder, Bags, you're interrogating the poor fellow again, laughed Brumman. He leaned back in his chair as if to leave the field to two well-matched adversaries. Paul hesitated. He didn't feel well-matched at all, and there was something about Professor Bagwalter that made him decidedly uncomfortable, although it was hard to define just what it was. Where Brummond, like Kluru and the others he'd met here, seemed as comfortable with life on Mars as a fish in a stream, the professor had a strange edge a questioning intelligence that seemed out of place. Still, just a few moments of listening to them talk about someone named Lubert in some place called Canada made it clear he would never be able to bluff his way through. I'm... I'm not sure how I got here, he said. I've had a head injury, I think. I found the boy. Actually, I don't remember very well. You'll have to ask him. In any case, there was some trouble. I remember that, and we escaped. First thing I really remember is floundering in the Great Canal. Well, doesn't that trump all, said Brumman, but he sounded less than astonished, as, as though this kind of thing happened rather frequently in his vicinity. Bagwalter, on the other hand, seemed quite pleased to have something around which to base an inquiry, and to Paul's discomfort and Hurley Brumman's great disgust, spent the next half hour questioning him closely. Paul was finishing his second throat-burning brandy and feeling a little more relaxed when the professor returned to the subject that seemed to interest him most. And you say you've seen this Venari woman before, but you don't remember where or when. Paul nodded. I just know. Maybe she was your fiancée, offered Brummond. Yes, I'll bet that's it. After sitting in bored silence for some time, he had suddenly warmed to the subject matter. Maybe you were injured, trying to protect her from the Sumbar's guards. They're heavy-handed fellows, you know, and pretty nimble with those scimitarish noggin loppers of theirs. That time they were going to pop Joanna into the Sumbar's seraglio, well, I had my hands full, and then some. Hurley, I, I wish, the professor began, but Brumman was not to be held back. His blue eyes sparkled, and his golden hair and beard seemed almost to crackle with static electricity. Joanna, she's my fiancée, the professor's daughter. I know, I know, damn presumptuous to call one's fiancée's father Bags. But the professor and I had been a great, been through a great deal before I ever met Joanna. He waved his hand. She's back at camp with the temperance right now, laying in supplies for an expeditionary voyage we're going to make to the interior. That's why I chased after you to tell the truth. If you'd been good old Kedgeri Kirk, I was going to offer you a place in the crew. Hurley, said the professor with some irritation, in any case, it seems like every time I turn around, one of these green-skinned wallas is trying to abduct Joanna. She's a sturdy gal and admirable as all get-out, but it's really a bit much. And monstrous. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've had to pull her out of some squanch hole or other. For goodness sakes, Hurley, I'm trying to ask Mr. Jonas some questions. Look here, Bags, just for once you've got to let go of all this science twaddle. This poor fellow's fiance has been kidnapped by the priests, and they're going to sacrifice the girl. They've they've beaten him so badly that he can hardly remember his own name, and you just as soon poke and prod him as offer any help, now wouldn't you? Here now, said the professor, taken aback. I I'm not sure, Paul began. But Hurley Brumman st stood up, unfolding to the full extent of his impressive height. Don't you worry, lad, he said, and almost knocked Paul across the table with a comra comradely crack on the back. I'll ask around. There's more than a few, both green and white, who owe a favor to Brumman of Mars. Yes, that's just what I'll do. Bags, I'll meet you back. 
Hmm, I'll meet you both in back of the club at sundown. He was gone from the room in three strides, leaving Paul and the professor almost breathless. He's a good lad, Bagwalter said at last. Tough as nails and big-hearted. And by Joanna loves him dearly. He took a sip of his sherry. But I do wish sometimes he weren't so damned stupid. Far across the desert, the sun had almost disappeared behind the distant mountains, going to rest, going to its rest contented after a long day scorching the upturned face of Mars. The last rays struck crimson glints from all of Tuktubim's windows and translucent spires. From the balcony, at the back of the Aries Club, Paul stared down the hillside on what seemed to be a vast scatter of rubies and diamonds. For a moment he wondered if this place could be the home he had sought. It was strange, but somehow quite familiar as well. He could not remember where he had been last, but he knew it had been somewhere different. There had been several somewheres in his past, he felt sure. And even without the specific memories, he felt rootless weariness in his bones and thoughts. Look at that, said Galley, pointing. Not far away, a huge flying ship, similar in shape to the ceremonial barges they had seen on the Great Canal, was slowly rising past the tower tops into the evening sky, guide ropes dangling. Hundreds of dark shapes moved on its decks and in the complicated rigging. Lanterns glowed along its length, dozens of bright burning points. The barge almost seemed to be a living constellation sprung from the vaults of the night. It's beautiful. Paul looked down. Galley was rapt, wide-eyed, and Paul felt something like pride that he had protected this boy, had brought him safely out of... out of... It was useless. His memory would not come. It's too bad Kluru didn't stay to see this, he continued. But I suppose it's all very familiar to him. Kluru of the Fisher people, perhaps feeling he had fulfilled his promise once Paul had discovered other Earthmen, had brought Galley back from the bazaar and then headed off to his shantytown beside the canal. Still, he was kind to us, and I was sad to see him go. He was only a nimble, said Galley dismissively. Paul stared at the boy, who was still raptly watching the airship. The remark seemed oddly out of character, as though Galley had absorbed some of the attitudes of those around him. Wind from the desert tonight? Professor Bagwalter released a thin stream of smoke from his lips, then screwed his cigar back into the corner of his mouth. It will be hotter tomorrow. Paul found that hard to imagine. I don't want to keep the boy up too late. Do you think Mr. Brumman is going to be here soon? The professor shrugged. You can never tell with Hurley. He produced and examined his pocket watch. He's only a quarter of an hour late. I shouldn't worry. It's flying away, said Galley. The large airship was disappearing into the growing darkness. Only the lights were visible now, bright pinpoints growing ever smaller. Bagwalter smiled at the boy, then turned to Paul. The little, little fellow tells me you rescued him from a place called the Eight Squares, or something. Was that back on Earth? I don't know. I told you my memory is bad. The boy says it's just down the Great Canal, but... I haven't heard of any such place here, and I've done a lot of traveling. His voice was light, but the shrewd eyes were again watching Paul closely. He also said something about the Black Ocean, and I can promise you there's nothing like that here. I don't know. Paul felt his voice rising, but could not make it sound normal. Galley turned from the balcony railing to look at him, eyes wide. I just don't remember anything. Bagwalter removed his cigar and stared at the smoldering tip, then lifted his eyes to Paul's once more. No need to get booked up, old man. 
I am being a bit of a bore, I know. It's just that there were some rather odd fellows asking questions, questions at, the, at the club a few days ago. Look out below! Something whizzed between them and hit the balcony floor with a loud slap. It was a rope ladder, and it seemed to have dropped onto them from nowhere. Stunned, Paul looked up. A shape hovered overhead like a dark cloud in an otherwise clear sky. A head poked out, peering down at them. Hope I didn't hit anyone. Damnably hard to keep this thing steady. It's Mr. Brumman, said Galley, delighted. And he has a flying ship, too. Climb up, shouted Brumman. Hurry! No time to waste! Galley went up the ladder, shinnying as quickly as a spider. Paul hesitated, still not quite sure what was happening. Go on, said the professor kindly. It does no good. Once Hurley's got a bee in his bonnet, there's no stopping him. Paul grabbed the swaying ladder and began to climb. Halfway to the waiting airship, he paused, beset by a kind of spiritual vertigo. There was something tragically familiar in this situation, leaving one barely understood place to scramble toward another even less comprehensible refuge. Would you mind moving on? Bagwalter said gently from below. I'm not getting any younger, and I'd just as soon be off this ladder as quickly as possible. Paul shook his head and resumed his climb. Brummond was waiting at the top and pulled him over the railing with a single tug. "'What do you think of this little beauty, eh, Jonas?' he asked. "'I told you there were a few favors I could call in. "'Let me show you around. "'She's a lovely piece of work, fast as a bird, quiet as grass growing. "'She'll do the job for us, you'll see.' "'What job?' Paul was getting tired of asking questions. What job? Brumman seemed dumbfounded. Why, we're going to rescue your fiance. At dawn, she goes to a special cell underneath the Sumbar's palace, and then it'll be too late. So we're taking her out tonight. Only a dozen guards, and we probably won't have to kill more than half of them. Before Paul could do more than open his mouth and close it again, Brumman had sprung away to the airship's oddly shaped ornately carved wheel. He pulled on it, and the ship rose so swiftly that Paul almost fell from his seat. The city dwindled below them. For the honor of your lady, Jonas, Brumman shouted. His golden hair fluttered in the strong wind of their ascent, of their ascent. His grin was a glinting spot in the gloom. And for the honor of our dear old earth, with mounting discomfort, Paul realized that they were in the hands of a madman. Chapter 25. Hunger. Netfeed News. D.A. cries foul as snipe case dropped. Visual. Azanuelo holding press conference. Voice over. Dallas County District Attorney Carmen Azanuelo said that the defection and disappearance of witnesses from her landmark murder prosecution is, quote, the clearest example of subversion of justice since the crack baron trial. Visual defendants at arraignment. The prosecution of six men, including two ex-police officers, for the murder of hundreds of street children, often called snipes, excited tremendous controversy because of the allegations that local merchants hired the men as a death squad to keep the upscale areas of Dallas-Fort Worth free of street children. Visual, children panhandling in Marsalis Park. Prosecutions for snipe hunting in other American cities have also had trouble obtaining convictions. Azanuelo. They have intimidated, kidnapped, or killed our witnesses, often with help from elements inside the police department. They are murdering children on the streets of America, and they're getting away with it. It's as simple as that. Good heavens, Papa! Will you quit complaining? I'm not complaining, girl. I'm just asking. Over and over again. Rini took a breath, then bent to try to pull the strap tight on the suitcase again. 
Few of their possessions had survived the fire, and the confusion of recent events had left Rini no time for shopping. But they still seemed to have more things than they did storage. We're not safe here in this shelter. Anyone can find us. I've told you a hundred times, Papa, we're in danger. That's the damned silliest thing I ever heard. He crossed his arms over his chest and shook his head as if to banish the whole concept into the oblivion it deserved. Rini fought a powerful urge to, to give up, to stop fighting. Maybe she should just sit down beside her father and join him in wishing the real world away. There was a freedom in being obstinate, the freedom of ignoring unpleasant truths, but someone finally had to acknowledge those truths, and that someone was usually her. She sighed. Get up, you old troublemaker. Jeremiah's going to be here any moment. I'm not going nowhere with no girly man. Oh, for God's sake. She bent over, pulled the strap tight across the straining suitcase, and secured it on the magnetic tab. If you say one Stupid thing to Jeremiah. Just one stupid thing. I'm going to leave you and your bloody suitcase by the side of the road. What kind of way is that to talk to your father? He glowered at her from under his brows. That man attacked me. He tried to strangle my throat. He came looking for me in the middle of the night, and you two had a fight. You are the one who went and got a knife. That's right. Long Joseph's face brightened. Oh, that's right. And I was going to cut him up for damn good too. Teach him to come sneaking around my place. Rini sighed again. Just remember, he's doing us a big favor. I'm on half pay while I'm suspended, Papa. Remember? So we're lucky to find somewhere to go at all. There isn't supposed to be anyone living in that house until they sell it. Do you understand that? Jeremiah could get in trouble, but he wants to help me track down the people who did this to Susan, so he's helping us. Okay, okay. Long Joseph waved his hand, indicating that, as usual, she was underestimating his social graces. But if he comes sneaking into my room at night and try to get mannish with me, I knock off his head. It's all new. Jeremiah pointed to the mesh fence that now surrounded the house. The doctor's nephew decided to improve the security. He thinks it will make it easier to serve the place. His pursed lips made it clear what he thought of these absentee landlords. So you should be safe. Very high-tech thing, this security system. Top of the line. Rini privately had doubts that the kind of people they seemed to be up against would have any problems getting through even top-of-the-line domestic security, but she kept them to herself. It was certainly an improvement over the shelter. Thank you, Jeremiah. I can't tell you how grateful we are. We really had no friends or family to go to. Papa's oldest sister died two years ago, and his other sister lives in England. Wouldn't give you a stick to scratch your back, that one, grumbled Long Joseph. I wouldn't take nothing from her anyway. The security gate hissed shut behind the car as they entered the semicircular drive. Rini's father looked up at the house with sullen amazement. God almighty, look at that. That's not a house. It's a hotel. Only white people have a house like that. You have to stand on the back of the black man to own a place so big. Jeremiah hit the brakes, skidding more than a few inches along the gravel drive. He turned in the seat and stared back at Long Joseph, his long features pinched in a scowl. You are talking like an idiot, man. You don't know anything about it. I know an Africana mansion when I see one. Dr. Van Bleek never did anything but good for anyone. Tears were welling in Jeremiah Dacot's eyes. If you're going to say things like that, you can find somewhere else to stay. Rini winced, embarrassed and angry. Papa, he's right. You're talking like an idiot. 
You didn't know Susan, and you don't know anything about her. We are coming to her house because she was my friend and because Jeremiah is doing us a kindness. Long Joseph raised his hands in martyred innocence. My God, you people get touchy. I didn't say nothing against your doctor lady. I just said that's a white people's house. You're a black man. Don't tell me you think white people have to work as hard as a black man. Jeremiah stared at him for a moment, then swung around again and inched the car forward to the front of the stoop. I'll get your bags out of the boot, he said. Rini glared at her father for a moment, then got out to help. Jeremiah took them upstairs, showed them to a pair of bedrooms, and pointed out the bathroom. Rini thought that her room, its walls papered in a faded design of cavorting rag dolls, must have been intended for a child, although the Van Bleeks had never had one. She had never thought much about Susan's childlessness, but now she wondered if it had been a greater sorrow than the doctor had let on. She poked her head into her father's room. He was sitting on the bed, examining the antique furniture with suspicion. Maybe you should lie down and have a nap, Papa. She deliberately made it more of an order than a request. I'll make some lunch. I'll call you when it's ready. I don't know if I can get comfortable. Big old empty house like this. I can try, I guess. You do that. She shut the door and stood for a moment, letting her irritation subside. She let her gaze slide along the walls, the wide, high-ceilinged hall. Stephen would love this, she thought. The thought of him bouncing excitedly down the hallway, exploring this new place, suddenly made her almost dizzy with loss. She swayed, her eyes stinging with tears, and had to clutch the banister. Minutes passed before she felt composed enough to descend to the kitchen and apologize for her father's behavior. Jeremiah, who was polishing an already gleaming pan, waved her explanations away. I understand. He's just like my father. That man never had a good thing to say about anyone. He's not that bad, Rini said, wondering if that were in fact true. He's just had a hard time of it since my mother died. Daco nodded, but did not seem convinced. I'm picking up your friend later tonight. I'll be happy to make dinner for you all. Thank you, Jeremiah, but you don't need to do that. She hesitated, wondering at the look of disappointment on his face. Perhaps he too was lonely. She knew of no other people in his life besides Susan Van Bleek and his mother, and Susan was gone. You've done us so many favors. I feel like I should cook for you tonight. You're going to mess around in my kitchen? He asked sourly, only half joking. With your permission, and with any advice you want to give gladly taken. Hmm, we'll see. It was a long walk between the kitchen and the living room, and Rini did not know where the light switches were. She made her way with great care down halls lit only by the thin orange light leaking in through the high windows from outside, trying to keep the ceramic lid on the casserole dish, despite hands made clumsy by potholders. The darkness seemed a tangible, powerful thing, an old thing, the security lights an inadequate human response. She swore as she banged her knee against an almost invisible table, but the reassuring no noise of the others came drifting down the hallway. There was always something on the other end of the darkness, wasn't there? Jeremiah and her father were making brittle conversation about the rich neighborhood of Kluf that surrounded them. Kabu, who had arrived with all his worldly possessions in one small, cheap suitcase, looked up from his study of Susan's cave painting photograph. Rini, I heard you strike against something. Are you hurt? She shook her head. Just a bump. I hope you all have your appetites. Did you find what you needed in the kitchen? Jeremiah cocked an eyebrow. 
break anything? Rini laughed. Nothing but my pride. I've never seen so many cooking things in my life. I feel inadequate. I only used one dish and a couple of pans. Don't talk yourself down, girl, said her father sternly. You are a real good cook. I used to think so until I saw Jeremiah's kitchen. Making my little chicken casserole there was kind of like hiking into the middle of the Kalahari just to dry your clothes. Kabu laughed at this, a delighted gurgle that even made Jeremiah grin. Ah, well, she said, everybody, hand me your plates. Jeremiah and Rini were finishing the bottle of wine. Her father and Kabu had been sampling beers out of the cold pantry, although Long Joseph seemed to be getting a disproportionate share. Jeremiah had built a fire in the wide stone fireplace, and they had turned most of the other lights out, so that the light in the wide living room wavered and danced. But for the murmuring of the fire, the last minute had passed in silence. Rini sighed. This has been such a nice evening. It would be so easy to forget all the things that, that have happened and just relax and let go. You see, girl, that's your problem, her father said. Relax, yes, that's exactly what you must do. You always worrying, worrying. Surprisingly, he turned to Jeremiah as though for support. She worked herself too hard. It's not that easy, Papa. Remember, we're not here because we want to be. Somebody burned down our flat block. Some other people attacked Susan. No, let's be honest, they murdered her. She cut a quick glance toward Jeremiah, who was staring at the fire, his long face somber. We know a little bit about the people who seem to be responsible, but we can't get to them. Not in real life, because they're too rich and too powerful. And probably not by stealth either. Even if Mr. Singh, that's the old man, Papa, the programmer, knows what he's talking about, and we need to investigate this big network they've built. I don't see where I fit in anyway. I don't have the equipment to stay online long enough to get through the kind of security they must have for this other land. She shrugged. I'm feeling pretty hopeless about where to go from here. Did they smash up everything, that, everything of the doctors you could use? Jeremiah asked. I'm still not sure I understand everything you've told me, but I know that Dr. Van Bleek would say you are welcome to anything that would help you. Rini smiled sadly. You saw what they did to her lab. Those bastards made sure there wouldn't be left anything left anyone could use. Her father snorted angrily. That is the way. That is always the way. We throw the Africana bastards out of the government and the black man still can't get no justice. Nobody will help my boy, my Stephen. His voice abruptly cracked and he brought one of his large calloused hands to his face before turning away from the fire. If anyone can find a way to help him, then your daughter can, Kabu said firmly. She has a strong spirit, Mr. Sulaweo. Rini was surprised by the certainty of his words, but the small man would not meet her gaze. Her father made no reply. Jeremiah opened a second bottle of wine, and the talk slowly and somewhat awkwardly turned to other things. I'm trying to see where a good place to stop is. Then Long Joseph began quietly to sing. Rini was at first only conscious of it as a low tone on the edge of her attention, but gradually it became louder. Imiti goba kale it. I don't know, the, I don't remember the melody, so that's why I'm not singing it. Kanje, 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 Kanje. It was old, an old Zulu nursery song, 
something Long Joseph had learned from his grandmother, a lilting, <coughs> repetitive melody as gentle as the wind it described. Rini had heard it before, but not for a long time. All the trees are bending, this way, now that way. All the leaves are shaking, this way and that, this way and that. A memory from her childhood surged up, from a time before Stephen had been born, when she and her mother and father had taken the bus to visit her aunt in Ladysmith. She had felt sick to her stomach and had huddled against her mother while her father had sung to her, and not just the Kanye, Kanye song. She remembered pretending to be sick even after she felt better, just to keep him singing. Long Joseph was swaying gently from side to side as his fingers tapped out a spidery rhythm against his sighs. Zifumulo kanjanina, itzinyone sidle keni. See them resting on this sunny day, those lovely birds in their happy homes. From the corner of her eye, Rini saw something moving. Kabu had begun to dance before the fire, bending and straightening in time to Long Joseph's song, his arms held out, stiff and angled, then brought back to his sides. The dance had a curious rhythm that was at once strange and soothing. Imiti goba kale, iti, iti, kunya kazu mahlampu, kanje, 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 kanje. Children, children, children come home. Children, children, children come home. Children, children, children come home. The song went on for a long time. At last her father trailed off, then looked around the firelit room, shaking his head as though he surfaced from a waking dream. That, that was very, very nice, Papa. She spoke slowly, fighting the wine and dinner thickness in her head. She didn't want to say the wrong thing. It's good to hear you sing. I... Haven't heard you do that in a long time. He shrugged, a little embarrassed, then laughed sharply. Well, this, this man here has brought us to this big house and my daughter cooked the supper. I figured it was my turn to pay for my keep. Jeremiah, who had turned from the fire to listen, nodded soberly, as though approving the transaction. Um, I think I'd better stop there, actually, because it's still a long scene, another five, ten minutes at least to go. Um, yeah, probably more like ten minutes. So I am going to stop there and continue with it for the 7 p.m. reading, which I know some of you probably listen to them on um, face, uh, YouTube, on Chris's YouTube, for those of you, yeah, you all must know about Chris's YouTube channel by now, although I'd need to post something on my, um, whatchamacallit. Um, so anyway, but I'll figure that out in a second, um, figure that out later. So anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, um, oh, Suzanne, thank you very much. That's, that's really kind. Suzanne has wished me happy birthday and happy friend anniversary because we became friends on my birthday in 2011 on Facebook. Well, how nice, Suzanne. Thank you very much. And with that, <coughs> I apologize for not reading longer, but it has been a bit of a long day. Um, and uh, I will, those of you in the California-ish time zone or in the general American West time zone, um, I will see you tomorrow at 7 if you are here. Um, for the next reading. And those of you who are not in that time zone but are in Europe, I will see you virtually but at one remove if you listen to the broadcast on uh, Facebook or on Chris's YouTube channel. But one way or the other, we will be together again. And I look forward to it. And I thank you. 
please, please um, take good care of yourselves, take good care of those around you, your loved ones, but also friends and neighbors and just anybody who needs it. These are tough times, um, not just the pandemic, but the state of the world here in our country. There's some definite concerns about the state of the nation as well. Um, but ultimately, democracy and kindness will win out. And I believe that strongly. And the way that we can make that happen is by taking good care of our institutions and taking good care of each other. So that's your assignment for next week. I will see you all very soon. Lots of love from our house. Be good. Peace.